this is a lecture about the economics of uh, economics of propaganda, and the plan is to discuss issues about how propaganda works. I'm not going to um, spend a lot of time explaining that this is an important subject. I will basically assume that everyone thinks that this is an important subject. I will, since I will start with a formal model of propaganda, the, the idea is that the formal model, the formal model works for itself. And generally, my um, my idea is very simple. First, to um, to present the Bayesian persuasion model of propaganda, which I think uh, demonstrates all the important features of propaganda or any kind of any kind of persuasion persuasion technique. Then I'll spend two slides showing what I was doing on a theoretical uh, frontier right now. This will be two slides about propaganda on networks. And then I'll talk about two papers which are empirical approaches to uh, evaluating the impact of propaganda. These two, uh, these two papers, they are not, uh, they are not directly, uh, directly related to the initial model of propaganda that I'm going to talk about. But the idea is that the first model of propaganda is the basic model. It's like the fundamental model of any situation in which one rational agent persuades another rational agent. In a sense, any uh, any empirical paper on propaganda is um, is relevant for this for this model. So I'll start with a formal uh, formal theory. I understand that you have heterogeneous background. So I'm sorry if someone is doing PhD in economic theory and this is like a trivial kindergarten material. This all will be very simple. So the general model of what I'm going to tell you is called Bayesian, Bayesian persuasion. This is a concept that was introduced by Mir Kaminica and Mir Kaminica in 2011. It's a model of information, uh, information communication. It's a model of a sender and the receiver, in which the sender and the receiver share the common prior, but their interests are not perfectly aligned. So then the sender has given to information design before she learns the state of the world, and the receiver knows that she uh, that the sender committed to an information design. And then in this model it appears that in this general setup it's possible to characterize the center optimal equilibrium. So uh, I need to say that all of the, the words Bayesian persuasion they appeared first in the Kaminica and Genskov paper. There were a lot of papers before their paper that uh, actually used uh, this model in different kind of different kind of situations. For example, Scott Gilbach and I used the model of, um, of government control of the media of propaganda and censorship before Kaminica and Genskov created like the general model. Of this, but the world's patient persuasion come from the means and the model. So, so why patient uh, persuasion is an appropriate framework to model propaganda and all kind of all kind of I don't know um, mass marketing? Because the important part I think of any economic model of propaganda is that the object of propaganda, the receiver of information, knows that she is being influenced. Then the object of propaganda should know that she is being influenced. It will be irrational. It will be not um, not economical to think about the situation when someone is being persuaded, and the person that is being persuaded is not knowing that she is being persuaded. For example, when you watch her watch television. And then you'll see in the advertisement, everyone knows that this is an advertisement. Everyone knows that the advertisement is paid for by the manufacturer of the wood. So nobody, uh, nobody uh, is uh, confused about whether this is, uh, this is an advertisement or not. And still, this works. So it's not, it's not working because you are being cheated about something. It's working despite that you know that the um, incentives for the producer of um, the advertisement are different from, from yours. So then, then these two important features, which, which should be um, a part of any formal model of propaganda, then the next thing, it should be incentive compatible for the objects to be influenced. So for the 
for, for the someone, for the receiver of information, to do what the sender of information wants, there should be some sort of incentive compatibility. So this person should be rational, calculate the outcome of what she does, and then do what the influencer wanted. Then finally, it should be incentive compatible for the object to obtain information. Because like, when you read something about propaganda in, um, in newspapers, or when our friends from physics or biology publish uh, their papers on propaganda in science and nature, they would always assume that it's something like a liquid matter, that information you could just put it in someone's head. But every economist knows that this doesn't work this way. That it should be incentive compatible for someone to consume or consume information. So if there is any opportunity cost, then the person wouldn't switch on the TV. So there is a reason for why the person swi switches on the TV and then watches the advertisement. And the patient persuasion model is something that accounts for all these uh, all these requirements the problem of propaganda. So the model itself, there are two states of the world, zero and one, and the receiver has to make uh, has to make an action. So the game is the sender uh, commits to the information design, then the receiver takes an action. And the uh, the utility function of the uh, of the receiver is that she wants to match the state of the world, right? So I have a parameter here to what extent she would she would want to make a mistake uh, to misread the first for, this, for the uh, second state or vice versa. But essentially, this utility function, she wants to match, uh, to match the state of the world and she doesn't want to um, miss the state of the world, right? She doesn't know the state of the world. It's, uh, it's the state, state of the world is not known to either receive the same sender, but the sender, the sender, could choose an information structure. Basically, the sender chooses what is going to be reported once the state of the world is realized. Right? So first, the sender chooses the information structure, then the state of the world realizes, then the information structure that was chosen by the sender runs, then the receiver makes, uh, takes an action. Here, in this simple model, the sender wants uh, to maximize the probability that action is, is one. So there are two states of the world, the receiver wants to match the state of the world, and the sender is not interested in matching the state of the world. The sender wants to just to um, maximize the probability that action one is taken. And they share the common prior, and the common prior is such that if there is no information, then the receiver just takes action zero. Is this setup clear? Great. So, think of the political economy, uh, political economy uh, interpretation of this story. So, suppose that sender is the leader who is interested in citizen support, A equal to one. He wants to maximize uh, maximize citizen support, and receiver is a citizen who would want support uh, the leader, but this is conditional on circumstances. So, for example, if the unrealized state of the world is where the leader is competent to deal with the crisis, or where the country is in danger, then the receiver might want to support the leader if the leader is competent, and not to support the leader if the leader is incompetent, or the receiver would want to serve in the army if the country is in danger, but she doesn't want to serve in the army if the country is not in danger. So then, leader commits uh, to an information design, which again is a very natural um, parallel into formal uh, patient persuasion setup. Because uh, when someone designs an information structure, an actual leader of an actual country, then uh, this leader sets up institutions, makes some personal appointments, but then uh, he doesn't have control over how this institution works or how the actual news are going to be reported. So like President Putin uh, put a lot of constraints on uh, TV news, but he doesn't check, uh, check out each news himself, right? So he appoints certain people, he uh, approves certain procedures, how the news are dealt with, then 
when the user edits, they report it according to these procedures and subject to the personal decisions by these people, but not by the editor himself. So, in a, in a sense, it is committed to information design. <coughs> okay, so it's a sort of an easy feeling. You could prove it directly in this example and you could use the general result of Ginsburg and Kamenica. Then, uh, that the sender is going to choose the following structure. If the state of the world, which is realized, is good for the sender, then the report is uh, the state of the world is one. So the user reported truthfully. And if the if the state of the world is unfavorable for the uh, sender, then it's with some probability it's reported that it's one. I will denote this probability beta. And um, with the remaining probability it's reported the truth is reported that the state is zero. And then uh, let's check what uh, what these beta device and the news should be so that the receiver takes an action uh, which is considered with the signal. So chooses one if the report is one and chooses zero if the report is zero. Then the standard optimal beta will be the largest possible beta which is consistent with the action uh, actions equal to the to the signal. Okay. Any questions so far? Uh, okay, so, so, first, suppose uh, that the receiver uh, receives a signal that the signal is zero. Then, given, given this structure, if the signal is zero, this means that the state is zero for sure, so there is no question about this, then the receiver just does zero. So if the government views are that the leader is incompetent, and you know that the news are censored, Okay, the deal is <laughs> No question about this. So like, uh, when in my childhood, the Soviet media reported with a three days delay that there is um, something bad happening at Chernobyl administration. Okay, no one suspected the Russian government lying the other way. No one suspected that, they, that there is no actual disaster and they just reported the disaster. <laughs> Right? Because we knew, given the uh, heavy censorship, that if there are news that there is a disaster, okay, we will be sure that this is a huge disaster, actually. So, okay, now, what if, I, what if the news are good? What, is, what, is, what if it's published in the newspaper that everything goes well? Okay, then, now, the receiver should compare uh, two expected utilities, if I do one, and the state is actually one, conditional on that I will signal one, plus, if the state is plus, I calculate the expected probability, if I do one, uh, and the state is actually zero, times the probability that it's actually zero, conditional on that I got a signal of one, and it should be, uh, the expected utility should be higher, then if I do the vice versa, if I do action zero, again, that's the utility of action zero, and the state is 1, this is the probability that the state is 1, when the signal is 1, plus I did 0, it is 0, and the probability is 0, conditional on that I got signal 1. So, I need to calculate this expected, um, this um, conditional probability using the best formula. So again, what's the probability to get, uh, to get information that signal is 1? What's the probability that the true state is 1 if the signal is 1, right? It's the probability that the signal is 1, conditional on that the state is 1, times the probability that the state is 1, and here the full probability of getting signal 1 is the probability to get signal 1 conditional on the state being 1, and the times the probability of the state being 1, plus the probability to get signal 1 conditional on the actual state being zero, the probability of the state being zero. So given our assumptions, beta is the level of bias, mu is the common prior, so one minus mu is the probability that the state is actually zero. So I use this formula to um, I fit this into here. This and this are zeros. So I get this um, 
this inequality, which is actually equivalent to a very simple inequality on the amount of bias. So, if the receiver knows, and we assume in the patient perception model that the receiver knows the bias for which the signal is going to be reported, and the receiver knows that the bias is less than this, then the optimal action for the receiver is just is just to follow um, is just to follow the signal. Now the sender is interested in maximum action. So here the maximum action happens. Uh, the action happens when um, uh, when the signal is equal to one. It happens with probability mu plus beta times y not minus mu, right? Because this is the probability that the true state is 1, and we report with the probability 1, so this is this term, plus the probability 1 minus mu, uh, the state is bad, but we report this as good, so this is the other term, so this is, um, the sign is interested as, as high beta as possible, so maximizing this, even this constraint makes this binding, so this is the, op the center optimal amount of bias. Now, we will do the same exercise, assuming that the receiver has to pay some cost to consume information. Again, again, consider such mechanism uh, for any beta. Do the same exercise for the incentive compatibility. So the incentive compatibility eventually will be that to consume this signal with the level of bias beta should be higher than C, which means, which means that the receiver would want to buy the media which sends the signal with this amount of bias. Um, again, this is just the same calculation as on the previous slide, and we will get the sender optimal, uh, sender optimal bias, which means that if the cost of subscribing to media is high, then the bias should be lower, so the use should be more fruitful. Otherwise, otherwise people would not, would not buy, buy this, um, not buy this um, media. So, now, what basically is delivered here is what was promised. So here, a person consciously buy something which is biased, the person knows that this is bias. The not, not, uh, she knows, the receiver knows the amount of bias, and it's still optimal to follow the signal, so to be persuaded. And the sender achieves its goal of persuading, persuading a person. And everything here, everything here, is achieved assuming full, full rationality. Not complete information, because they both do not know the state of the world, but the receiver is not cheated in any, in any way. They have a common prayer, the sender commits to information design, then the receiver has incentives first to buy this information, then to follow, to use this information. So an important takeaway here that you will have a model of propaganda in which of the equilibrium path the person is being influenced by advertising or propaganda and the receiver is fully conscious that she, she is being influenced and about the way she is being influenced. Still, she is being influenced. Okay, so I'm going to go through a small theoretical, theoretical applications, just like an introductory example of our paper with uh, Georg Yegorov. So now, it's a, the, same, the same exercise, the same persuasion with the same even with the same location, but now uh, a person who is being persuaded, uh, she's a part of a network, and this network is a network with penetration rate P, and this is an extremely simple network. So in our paper, there are many many possible networks, but here it's just a network of two of two people. They are connected. Uh, they are connected by an edge, and information flows through this edge with probability P. So, if one agent is a subscriber of the media that we just discussed, then the other goal has the same information with having uh, a probability P. So, we could consider two situations. We could consider equilibrium in which first agents subscribe, 
and they do this only if this is incentive compatible, and then uh, they uh, receive information and act. So suppose that there's, there's one subscriber. So then, if, if there's one sub subscriber, then the amount of information, the amount of bias that the sender would put into, into the media is given by this formula, we just derived it. So this is the maximum bias. Then the other is not subscriber, but we could calculate the total amount of expected action, right? So this is the subscriber, so she receives, if there is a signal that the state of the world is one, then she receives it. So this is the probability that the, the signal that the state is one is received. This is the probability that the subscriber receives it. This is the probability that the not subscriber receives it, right? So this is the total expected amount of action. Okay. Now suppose suppose that we have um, that we have uh, both agents subscribing. Now the incentive constraint for each of these two subscribers is slightly different, right? Because now uh, if I'm subscribe if I'm a person and I sus and I consider subscription, then this is what I get if I subscribe. This is the value of the signal, this is the cost of subscription, but, but I could get the same information for free with probability P, right? Because this is a network of penetration rate P. So from this incentive constraint, I could calculate the maximum amount of bias, and this maximum amount of bias is going to be smaller than here, right? Because here I did not care about the other incentive constraint. Here, if I put too much bias in the signal, then one of them is not going to be a subscriber. So if two of them are subscribers, then the amount of propaganda that would be fed to them is smaller. So here you could calculate the total expected action is given here. And it appears that if you compare these two subscription structures, these are the payoffs, the payoffs of the sender. So this is the total amount of expected action. Right? So this is P, the penetration rate of the network. So it appears that uh, if P is low, if it's below a certain threshold, then the sender would prefer that two agents are subscribers. And if P is larger than this, then the sender would prefer that only one, uh, one agent is a subscriber. It seems, it seems a sort of a very theoretical exercise. Like, I mean, I'm, I'm not even sure that this looks like an interesting fact. But extend this, extend this analysis, this logic that you could do, this formulas to the following networks. These are two star networks. And it appears that when P is low, not necessarily close to zero, just less than, less than say, about one half, then when P is close uh, to zero, then this is the standard optimal subscription structure. So that every peripheral agent in a star network is a subscriber, and the centrally connected agent is not a subscriber. And vice versa, when P is close to one, then the center optimal equilibrium is that the central agent is a subscriber and others are not subscribers. And I think this is, uh, this is already sort of theoretically interesting because in a lot of writing about propaganda, you would think, or advertising, people think about like influencers. They will do a social network, they will single out the centrally connected individuals and then think that it's important to feed propaganda to them. But what this very simple logic demonstrates is that uh, when you feed propaganda to the centrally connected agent, then because of the incentive constraints for other agents, you have to do less of bias in your signal, which eventually um, doesn't allow to get the optimal amount of action. So this is actually the assembly uh, preferred assembly preferred structure. So if the penetration rate in the network is not that high, then if you think about spreading some ideas or advertising some good in a network, then you should try you should target not the centrally connected agents, but the uh, but the peripheral connected agents, which I think is very much like against the common logic and the way 
um, the way how people think. So that's one place in which like an economic model of propaganda does diverge from um, what a physicist physicist thinking that information is like a fluid matter like water. Um, what it wants. Because of course, if it's like water, then you pour it into the central mechanical agent and then it goes around. But with information, you actually crowd out other possible subscribers, so it's better to focus on peripheral agents. Okay, any questions about phase of life? Great. The empirical, empirical part. But if I'm, if I'm Yes. Can you extend this to um, if it's possible to acquire a cost but individually, the, the pure information? And to acquire, uh, acquire information from... Uh, unbiased information. Biased by, uh, by, uh, by the receivers. So there's some cost acquired by unbiased information. Okay, this will be a more complicated model. I think if each of the agents would pay for acquiring, for acquiring the true information, okay, then the like the the result which will be parallel to this will be then you should censor the more centrally you would you would censor the more more centrally connected and connected uh, agents in the network. Um, okay, yes, yeah. It will, I mean, if you would allow for this in this model, this would not, this would not kill our results, but it will work in the other, other direction. I guess I'm thinking about something like advertising. Where the advertiser gives you biased but free information about some components, and for certain things it's optimal for you to just accept it. Whereas if you have high enough value for the unobserved uh, okay. characters, then what this model says that if the advertiser provides free information, like they could waive the subscription fee, mm -hmm. then uh, contrary to a kind of belief wisdom, uh, in networks with low P, they should target peripheral agents to the centrally connected. And I think, like in his popular culture, the universal target essentially connected. Uh, could you uh, frame the model thinking about this receiver with different level of uh, somehow sophistication? Because uh, if you understood, uh, you have the receiver that they are treated all in the same way, while uh, it could be that someone will, uh, you know, perceive uh, the message, while others will perceive uh, somehow half of the message or I don't know how to... Um, the, the, thing, the thing is that a lot, a lot of, I think, like, naive ones pro pro propaganda, they sort of assume, uh, they make very strong assumptions about like specific ways in which receivers um, grow with information. For example, the most straightforward assumption is that receivers believe that the information is true and do not suspect that it might not be, uh, not be true. So, in a sense, if we assume this, then it will make our results sort of stronger. If, if there are people who just believe the information, then certainly it's easy to understand. And the presence of the network should just reinforce, should, should just reinforce this. Uh, okay, so uh, what uh, what I described here, like not in the last two slides, was a basic theoretical model of um, of influence of propaganda, but still, uh, still, um, it's of course uh, very much a empirical question. So still, the question is how propaganda works is is a question for empir empirical. Economists, and one big question is whether the um, work at all. So, a lot of naive thinking and a lot of journalist writing is assumes that propaganda works very well. So, there are literary hundreds, dozens of articles appear every day 
saying that propaganda works, that like Russian trolls swayed, uh, swayed American elections, that um, it's Russian TV which made Russians uh, hate Americans and uh, Ukrainians, that it was Russian propaganda that made Ukrainian Jewish oligarch being basically the new hero. Uh, okay. The problem is that there is a huge issue of identification in the impact of propaganda. So I would say that for anyone who thinks who thinks that uh, it's easy to prove that propaganda works, like a mental exercise should be like when I'm going to a supermarket, do I buy everything that uh, that I've seen being advertised? Do I buy every toothpaste? Do I buy every toothbrush um, when I go to the supermarket just because I was told to do this on TV? And the next question, why do you think that other people are most treated than you? Do you think like it's like a like the first order delusion that people always do what advertisers tell them to do. The high order delusion is that I am sophisticated enough not to do this, but all <laughs> others do. This propaganda works on them. I know that I'm being propagandized, so I'm not. I know how to work this out, but others, they don't know, so they hate Americans because the Jews have told them to, and told them to hate, hate them America. So in this literature, in this literature, the issue of identification is a, is a huge, is a huge issue. So like the. Uh, it's, it's, it's sort of surprising that when you think of a published paper, when you want to like to make a strong reference, look at um, look at some evidence that propaganda actually works. There are there is a huge perception that everybody knows this, and there are very few studies that has uh, proved this, like um, according to the 21st century standards of the. Economics, economic science. So basically, there are two major, two major papers. And then I told I'm going to talk about this paper in more detail, and I'm not going to talk about the Nigazawa drought paper. But in both cases, they used a variation in something which was totally exogenous to what they uh, discussed to um, to establish that there is an impact of propaganda. So in Adena, I told it was about Nazi propaganda. They used the exogenous variation in signal strength in the transmission sta station locations. They uh, used the data on all German radio subscription. Of course, this should have been a very special country like Germany that still has records of all the radio subscriptions uh, in the early 30s and early 20s. And then Dini Gazavadrod, who studied the impact of um, the impact of anti hutu propaganda in in Uganda, he basically used two uh, big transmission stations, and then he used the specific specifics of the Uganda terrain to have a totally exogenous um, area of coverage by the signal, and then he used this variation to estimate uh, to estimate the propaganda and establish that this is not this is a causal not. This is a causal relation and uh, not correlations. So next I'm going to sort of very briefly, very briefly discuss the Nazi propaganda, Nazi propaganda paper by five authors. It was published in PG in uh, 2015. And then uh, uh, Randy Kalov of Maria Petrova and Renik Santaros and uh, Ekaterina, Ekaterina Jurovska, who are like the leaders of uh, empirical verification propaganda works. So they looked at the data on propaganda on German, on, on German radio. The, um, the radio in Germany started in a large, on a large scale in 1923, but before 1929 it was almost ex exclusively non-political. Then, since 1929, since the moment uh, when Nazis initiated referendum on their Soviet separations, the government started to use uh, radio to um, for political campaigns. 
And up until January 1933, the government was able to deny uh, Nazis the access to radio. Then there was a sharp, a sharp change in February 19, 1933 when Adolf Hitler was appointed the Chancellor of uh, the Chancellor of Germany. He was a minority, and he was a minority party leader. But there was um, there was a certain agreement, a certain pact in the parliament, so he was appointed chancellor, and uh, in, almost immediately his party got uh, a lot of influence over the exec executive branch. Then his party won; they actually didn't get a majority in the key elections five weeks later. Also in the same period, the party expelled almost uh, almost a hundred candidates from the parliament, a hundred members from the parliament. So with the minority share got to the elections and a lot of opposition candidates being excluded from the parliament, they got the actual majority and then this ended only uh, when the Soviet troops uh, took, took Britain in 1945. So the point here is that there was a breaking point in the, in the radio coverage. Here is the illustration about the political broadcast by the year. So the basic name, the offers, this is kind of a painstaking, uh, painstaking um, two years of pain, um, very uh, labor heavy, uh, heavy research. They basically marked all the, uh, all the programs and they, you would see the amount of political broadcast by the year. Then you'll see a great change in the presence of uh, political broadcasts, right? So uh, if you measure just political broadcasts by election campaigns and their affiliates, then you'll see the, ch the change between um, elections in late 32 and early and March 33. So this is the amount of Nazi propaganda. This is the propaganda for all parties. So there was a huge a huge change in the Nazi propaganda. Before that, they had only they had access only once in uh, relations. So one thing that uh, again I told he used in this paper was the variation in signal strength. That was changing. That was changing all the time. So this is maps for different maps of uh, signal strength, and they located every transmission tower and then marked every every area um, in terms of variations of strength, how the strength changed over these over five years. And the results that we got was that um, if Nazis would, would have had access to, to radio, they would have uh, about four percentage points more uh, in the elections of 1930. If they were, wouldn't have this access, when Adolf Hitler became Chancellor, then the subsequent elections would result in a 3% percentage point lower vote share for the Nazi party. So it might seem a smaller change, but they wouldn't have achieved the majority of seats with their coalition partners even after the exclusion of the opposition candidates. Of course, this is not the same that this was like the history would go the other way. Maybe we, they would just have expelled more uh, members of the parliament or killed more or arrested more communists. Uh, communist members so, and counterfactuals is a counterfactual in an in empirical exercise. Still this is uh, this is a big impact of the um, of, of propaganda. So there are a lot of results in this paper. One thing uh, one thing that they established quite well because they control like for the uh, for the Jew Jewish share, for the export of people to Jewish people or Jewish um, Jewish establishments, is that the predispositions of the listen listeners matter a great deal for the effect of propaganda. So media propaganda works better in places uh, with strong predisposition to its messages, and the propaganda backfires if the recipients of the message uh, are negatively predisposed. Actually, if 
if we go back to the model that we discussed, you will see that if the prior, if the prior is the common prior is heavier into the standard favorite outcome, the state of the world, then then um, the sender could put into more bias than uh, than otherwise. Okay. Of course, of course, uh, this paper, the validity of this exercise, the idea that this paper establishes a causal link, it very much rests on the identifying, identifying assumption. And here it's that con conditional unobservables, the radio signal strength is uncorrelated with unobservable determinants of Nazi political support. So, of course, they included all time invariant district characteristics, but still, this identifying assumption, which which is an assumption, which is not a defect, the right? They uh, cannot directly test it, so they do a series of reality checks, and they uh, one they try to show that it's unlikely that these unobservable are driving these results. They do placebo tests. They uh, placebo tests. I'll, I'll talk about this uh, a little bit later. They do. Final fixed effects, um, final fixed, fixed effects regressions. At least this makes the identifying assumptions more plausible. So, for example, the placebo tests show, and the paper reports dozens of these this kind of tests, is that the German radio availability was not associated with the outcomes that was not supposed to affect. So, for example, in the apolitical part of the of the history. So when there was no political broadcast on radio, then the same radio signal strength that had an impact in uh, the future elections did not have any elections, so it didn't affect both the shares of the votes for extremist parties and the changes in the share of the votes by the uh, extremist parties. The same thing that the signal strength uh, Afterwards, was not affecting anything that was uh, happening before. Before that, okay. So, this is the Adams paper. The next paper that I wanted uh, to talk about is a new paper which we wrote, Western Right. It's about United States government propaganda. So, of course, propaganda today <laughs> is a huge thing. The United States government spends a lot of uh, a lot of money to do information operations. So this particular this particular story is about information operations that the United States uh, uh, coalition forces do in Afghanistan. And basically, uh, I mean, we, we we discuss different surveys, we measure different outcomes, and we discuss different things. But one specific thing that we are fo focusing on is the. Um, Improvised explosive devices. The improvised explosive devices, the roadside bombs. This is the thing that kills, um, this is the main cause of death and injury for uh, coalition forces and for the government forces in countries of conflict. So, this is a big thing. And the information operations, they are, uh, the purpose of these information operations is to persuade people to report when they see. Yeah, when they see um, improvised um, explosive devices. So when they see the self-made bombs, the importers, then the government sends someone to neutralize the bomb. So basically, what we're trying to do, we do this in different ways. We're trying to do uh, the impact of information operations on the actual amount of IEDs reported and the actual amount of bombs being neutralized by uh, American forces. So the American government, they do posters, so they show that this is dangerous to have uh, improvised explosive devices. They put messages into the news, for example, about Taliban attacks that uh, kill uh, people. Sometimes these messages, sometimes they just inform who is responsible for killing innocent people, sometimes, sometimes they're just news about, uh, about news of successful 
and neutralization of roadside bombs. Sometimes they just point out how, you know, they just explain the ways in which you could report an improvised explosive device and save some, uh, save, save some lives. So, um, in our paper, we uh, use a lot of surveys, and the analysis of surveys shows that those people who <coughs> tend to report that they um, watch the government news a lot, they are the same people, this is heavily correlated with uh, these people willingness to report um, improvised explosive devices. Then we match this uh, database with the da database that American military uses, which accounts for every single thing that happens to, uh, to American troops in Afghanistan. So then we verify that in those, uh, in those locations in which people report more willing, uh, in which people answer the survey questions they have, that they are more willing to report uh, the IDs. These are the same questions that are, these are the same locations in which there are more IDs reported and there are more IDs neutralized. So, and the impact is actually huge. So the 10% more exposure results in um, uh, it, 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 it results in almost 10%. Um, it's, it's almost one to one. Right? Um, the, no, it's not one to one. It's one to the one standard deviation uh, more exposure results in 10% increase in the in the uh, in the bomb, bomb neutralization. The thing is that. We do this with surveys, but we of course have military and military data, but of course we cannot do proper identification, so we do not know whether it is the, the propaganda works, or it might be that it's vice versa. So there are places where people do more to report the improvised explosive devices, there are people where people, there are locations in which people are more um, problem to cooperation with the United States forces, and these are the same locations in which people are more likely to answer surveys that they watch the government-sponsored television and that they are more willing to help um, to help uh, the government and Americans. So it's not a causal relationship. So to uh, get closer to a causal relationship, we do the following. We we use the following quasi-geographics experiment. So this is one body um, in Afghanistan, and there was a special um, radio station located here. So it's um, the bulletin speaker device here, and it produced mostly music and entertainment, but it also produced messages about the danger of roadside bombs and the need to report them. So then we put a grid on the uh, on this terrain, we looked at all the locations, uh, like these are people who are answering surveys um, on the grid. Then we put the distance from the transmitter, right? So this is the area of high coverage, this is a lower coverage, lower, lower, lower. So we sort of get, got um, a variation in the sigma strength, the length, the mm -hmm the length of the distance from the transmitter. Then we matched with, with all the data on military episodes. So this is either a bomb neutralized, or bomb reported, or bomb exploding, or an attack on American convoy, or something. Then we did, we did some data work on, on this paper. So like one first, first evidence, this is this is time. This is the moment when this radio station was uh, was located. So this is the amount of um, uh, this is the amount of uh, civilian tips and um, about the improvised explosive devices. So it's it's reasonable to infer that there is actual there is actually an impact of putting this transmitter here on the amount of tips that. 
uh, pathologies, pathologies received. Then the same thing about neutralization. So it's not tubes received, but it's actually about mindry going and then finding um, a neutralizing, neutralizing bomb. So this, uh, this uh, looks like a strange thing because it seems that there was a spark in roadside bomb neutralization, but it happened before, uh, before the transmitter was put in place. Okay, we account for this. This was a raid by Marines which was preparing the area for the um, for putting the transmitter, transmitter there, so this, this might, might have some explanation. Then we established that there is actually kind of um, a strong evidence that uh, the distance, uh, the distance uh, played a big role uh, and uh, close closer than 20 kilometers, there is a big impact of the differential access to the signal. After 20 kilometers, it doesn't, it doesn't have any impact. So this paper is very much still a work in progress. It's not, it's not yet even put as a working paper, but this is the kind of thing that people try to do when uh, they try to uh, understand the causal effects of propaganda. Okay, so this is my last slide. The first um, takeaway is that propaganda is consistent with rational, with strategic interaction of rational, forward-looking agents. Both the receiver, the receiver would want to pay to get the biased information and then to act and act according to the biased information. And it might be, it might be the sender would be able to be. The, to do this and is able to persuade the receiver to do something. And empirically, and the identification is a very serious issue. So basically, you could do, if you're interested in propaganda, the following exercise. Uh, read a newspaper article about the impact of propaganda. Uh, then construct a mental model showing that identification actually doesn't work. So the author of the paper doesn't know what to share his statement. Dear Professor, thank you for such an inspiring uh, presentation. Um, I just, it seems that when um, when there is no any uncertainty about the fact that if this new, uh, if the news is the truth or if it, it's a part of propaganda, then um, uh, then an agent will not believe it. So, in other words, uh, so what should be done in order to make propaganda not work? Um, okay, okay. So, the first question is like, what in my lecture, or uh, anyway, why, what, make you, what makes you think that there is something wrong about propaganda? Do you, want, do you want to do in the world about advertising? It seems that it's uh, propaganda. Do you know that there is a cure for cancer or for baldness or for anything? Or do you know that there is a method to this? <laughs> but it seems that propaganda makes uh, ma markets not uh, like politics uh, work in an inefficient way. In, in general, because the, when there is no propaganda, then there is competition. So basically, you're saying that because of the ability to advertise with political competition is less efficient. I'm sure it is. How would you know about opposition candidates in Moscow or in any elections if there is no way to advertise and propaganda? Or so just advertising? How would you not ever know about? That's like the new role of Soviet leaders. You, you, like, you never discuss, uh, you never discuss the, the qualities of the current leaders, right? Oh, it's maybe it's about definition. So uh, in such way, propaganda is just advertising, like advertising of every politician, and it doesn't. Because I'm, uh, I mean, propaganda is when, like in Russia, uh, so when there is an advertisement of just one person, and so 
and there is no competition in general. So because of that, I interpret it as in a, as in a negative way. No, 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 I, I, understand, I understand this, but like, the proper counterfactual relation would be to prohibit all propaganda, just, you just pro propose to, to prohibit propaganda of a certain, of a certain person or a certain man, no. and then wrong. Connected to that, or based on uh, what you said, that in that case, what is the definition of propaganda? Because I also have, for me, it's something negatively connotated for some reason. Uh, when I hear it, I think of something negative, and I don't know anything about propaganda. But isn't it interesting that it, I automatically connotate it with something that's negative? So yeah, I would like to know what is propaganda for you, and what is the difference between you just said advertising? Would you like to live in a world without advertising? I, what I, is I, the I difference would say information, in, okay. information provision will be go to influence the actions of the receiver. Okay. Well, yeah. Okay. Is it bad on itself? I, I don't know. So but like all the, the, two, the two cases, the two papers that I discussed here, one uh, one paper is Nazi propaganda. I mean, the know the term. Turned out that it, it, it was probably evil from the very beginning. And the other is actually, I mean, these are peacemakers who, uh, who encourage population to report towards roadside bombs. It's, it's hard to make argument that this is bad in some cases, and make harm to the people. Yeah, I think that's all. So I thought about an idea and I want you to tell me if it's a good idea or a bad idea. I mentioned one of my favorite books is this one, first by Glantz, the historian, and now by Gerasimova, in which the Soviets propaganda erased the losses of the Soviet Union at Rajev and emphasized Operation Saturn in Stalingrad. It turns out the Russians lost double the German losses in the Rajev. And almost no historians mention Rajev or mention it in a very minor way. So it would be an interesting event study of the effect of propaganda on sophisticated listeners. Presumably historians of World War II are sophisticated so that we would look at their interpretation of the war and the pivotal nature of Stalingrad for history books published before Glantz came out with his book and afterwards. Okay, uh, just for those who are not in the, uh, in the loop of this discussion that we have with the John Bush, in many years, everyone knows that the major battle of 1942 in World War II was the battle of Stalingrad, and then the operation, operation Saturn, yeah. Saturn uh, which was the encirclement of the German troops there, but less, much less people know that there was a significant with that, that there was an operation Mars um, close to, to the north of this operation close to Rajev, and it used basically the same amount of troops as the Stalingrad operation, but it resulted in a huge losses in in, in enormous amount, an enormous amount of losses given like on the road. What do and was a total failure. I mean, it was a failure because it was an attempt to encircle, but basically the Russian army was lost. And all of this operation has sort of never been secret in the Soviet Union. It has never made it to any kind of a textbook. So everyone who has been created from the Soviet high school would remember the Battle of Stalingrad, like in, 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 in detail, but wouldn't know about this. Mars operation. What I wanted to say about this thing, that what it, what would be interesting to me to know, this is sort of tangential relation related to what I was talking about, is whether this was sort of a conscious propaganda effort of the Soviet authorities, or this was just um, kind of um, um, a, a natural, natural natural thing done by many people who doesn't want to hear stories about uh, about 
uh, losses, they would then want to hear stories about eventual wins. So just like, the, like you mentioned, you mentioned the sure. alternative reality in which the setting of authority doesn't make any like any censorship attempts. Just people read books or make movies, and people uh, buy books. And I could imagine that the story of Stalingrad, like the story of nearly defeat and then a huge victory, would be bought, I don't know, maybe 1,000 times more people than the story of a huge loss. There are a couple of, for example, there are a couple of prominent Russian books which deal with the army tailor, like Kazakich's Zvezda novel. But they are much less popular than uh, the world of the peace and the world of peace and other things. The reason we know it's propaganda is Glantz showed that entire records were expunged. So literally 350,000 people disappeared from Soviet records in 1942-43. I think what we know now that they, they, did not, they did not delete them from the kind of... Um, so that's okay, that's more complicated. For example, Masha, everybody knows there was a poem, Yogi Prashov, yeah, which was a thinly veiled reference to a huge, uh, to a huge loss. And this was, I mean, it was by prominent Soviet poet, and everyone, everyone, I would say, felt about the reference in this, in this poem. So, like, yeah, no, yeah, that's it. what I'm saying that. This is not like a very clear cut case of propaganda. I mean, here, for example, in our paper in question, the whole idea was to focus to something which is very much devoid of all kind of other considerations, which will look like a very small information operations, very targeted, with very clear, very clear goals. Like, okay, you would say that the whole history of World War II was sort of you would say whitewashed, I would say very much biased toward positive, positive side, right? The superior whole army is different, I think. Um, okay, yeah. Yeah. the same thing about King of Encirclement. Encirclement, this is like, was the largest, um, the largest loss of manpower, by right? They were imprisoned, not killed, right? Encirclement, not killed. Okay, no, nobody, right? Also, but we have data on it, that's a point. So I have two questions. Uh, you compare propaganda with advertising, but for example, when I go to the shop, to the supermarket, I count my money and I can calculate, for example. So I have some habits and I don't want to change, but do you assume that people react on the propaganda in the same way? They can calculate the, some utility function for a short, for a long term and understand what they need to buy or to reject. And the second question about also the, this, this advertising, for example, if I see advertising for one day, probably I will not change my mind. But if I see the same advertising for one year, maybe I will change my preferences. And that's true. Let me think of a, uh, of a competitive, of like very competitive markets. And there are, I mean, toothpaste is, uh, this is a kind of a uh, monistic market that is extremely competitive, right? And typically, you have um, advertisement on the same scale of all these three major producers. Still, people do not buy all three brands. Most of people use one brand, which means that like two thirds of propaganda in the market has just zero income. Yeah, but what I lose from shifting my point of view about polit political view, I mean, just uh, I I don't like um, I, in shop I lose my money, but what I'm losing from shifting my political view, th this may be. I mean, like, okay, I, I would say what, what, what I think uh, is related that like one observation in which all the students of propaganda sort of believe in that there are no. Not yet, like very good experiments that demonstrate this, is that people are more easily persuaded when they do not have access to the way to verify the information. 
So like Russian people are more likely to believe that Americans are evil than that the American dollar is weak. That's like one example in 2014 when there was like a, a lot of a lot of anti-American propaganda, but at the same time there was a lot of propaganda saying that ruble is strong and the dollar is weak. And it seems that like people totally ignore this. The same people who are people who were uh, report, uh, reporting uh, increased hatches to all things American, uh, actually, yeah, that think that they didn't stop watching American movies. They reported that they uh, think negatively of Americans, but wouldn't stop watching American movies, and they wouldn't, uh, they wouldn't keep rules any longer because of this propaganda. So people would react only to what they see in the exchange rate market, in the exchange market, not what they hear from TV. So that's, yeah, that is, uh, th there is actually an experiment called the, the Hong Kong experiment. It's a paper by David Zang and Mao Newton and their authors. And they tried to influence people providing them with information that actually participated in student protests. And it appears that it's very difficult to manipulate people's own beliefs about like how many protesters are there or how likely the process to succeed, things like this. But it, it appears that it's much easier to manipulate people's, people's belief about what other people think. So it's hard to persuade a person to change for his mind. But it's sort of easy to persuade a person uh, to change person's opinion about what in others people others people mind. That actually might be the, why the most advanced um, advanced um, media manipulators like the British uh, tabloids or Fox News and MSNBC they spend so much time, like it seems like a couple of the time, they discuss what other journalists say and what other people think, not the actual actual events. Thinking about who is receiving the information, the propaganda, uh, could you think that uh, uh, somehow your model uh, could be some designed also taking into consideration uh, theory like uh, level K, that is uh, you have uh, uh, these uh, receivers that are somehow divided in different levels in... Uh, are you the level here of your beliefs? Yes, cognitive, oh. yes, because in this way, what I th if I understood well, your model will, be, uh, will provide different uh, results accordingly to the target in the level key, and moreover, on the amount of people that uh, are in the target uh, propaganda is uh, addressing. Uh, I, yes, that's, I, I think what you say is, is true. And I think that this Hong Kong experiment sort of addresses the issue, because they, they, this is about second quarter meetings, not first quarter meetings. Yes. But what I tried to emphasize here is that you actually do not need to have uh, to manipulate high order beliefs mm -hmm. to have a meaningful manipulation of persons uh, persons um, persons beliefs, right? Like typically, I mean, not that theoretical, but typically, a theorist would say that if you would manipulate high order beliefs, then you would certainly be able to manipulate lower order beliefs. Right, so this is kind of this as a theory is sort of sort of more power. I think this uh, this starting model that I described to you, it's a kind of it's the very basic model. You cannot you cannot do more basic than that. You cannot have uncertainty about less than two states, right? There should be at least two states. There should be at least two players uh, in strategic interaction. And still, in this very simple setup, you would have kind of a meaningful manipulation of other person's, other person's actions. So what I'm saying, that you, said you suggest to give me more power to get results that I want. But I'm like, um, 
these people who are making scar worker, I do not need it. <laughs> I will do this. No, 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 they are very nice results, but the point is that what I'm suggesting could uh, uh, help uh, in uh, explaining why, for instance, with propaganda they address a specific uh, right. yeah. specific target because you, they recognize all these guys walking oh, half a day so. that uh, they recognize that um, you can have uh, more or less sophisticated uh, people and so addressing one of this part uh, you can have uh, somehow higher effect with respect to what yeah, you are. So it's yeah. a sort of further step in the order in which you want to investigate propaganda which manipulates inside the receivers. That is, yes. Okay, any other? Yeah. You mentioned the amount of political broadcast in your table, but how, how did you count that? Oh, typically, my legal friends would put like 30 research assistants and label every, everything as a political or non political. If, uh, like nowadays, <laughs> nowadays the, in the United States, the Federal Communication Commissions would actually uh, do this, this labeling. So they would, uh, like, they would sort of mark the time that is political political broadcasts, but otherwise people would do, I don't know, by keywords, by mentioning political parties, by uh, presence of party officials, so all kind of, all kind of things. So I, I think in the table that I showed you here, they just marked the appearance of party members or their affiliates, so people who would just state that they are Nazi party members in the broadcast. Like, did they like, listen to records or? I know I do not know about this particular study, but I know about people who would put thirty such assistants to listen and to watch everything and that. Yeah. And for, for example, they could do like two research assistants watching independently and marking the political and then they will the political content and then they will just look at only those that were, were independently marked the same scale of research assistants. So people do this, please, the answer is... Sorry for the last question. Why did I let you ask me? Thank you so much for a very interesting uh, lecture, a huge fan of your work. I was going to ask, uh, I think a couple of years ago, someone in Russia, I think it was Maxim Katz, did this experiment when they actually like, took 30 research assistants, you know, and they made them watch everything that was going on on Russian television, like every news issue, and they marked everything like political or not political or propaganda, not propaganda. Did you follow uh, that? Yeah. Yeah. <laughs> All right, okay, okay. I'm not sure what the technology was. Yeah. Okay, thank you.